Namalipol meet in another the author Kishwar Deshai, who's made a remarkable uh, you know move from the world of journalism and newsrooms to the world of literature. So it's been a fascinating journey, and we are so glad that we get to discuss her work, The Longest Kiss. Unfortunately, this is one of the shortest sessions that we have here. We'll be covering this work and the work that went behind it over the next half an hour. I invite everyone's cordial attention and participation in this session. As you know, this is um, the work based on the life of the eminent actress Kishwar, I'm sorry, uh, Devika Rani. But before that, I think it's only right that we welcome Madam Kishwar Deshai on her first visit to Calicut. Welcome, ma'am. And we hope you have a comfortable journey here. Stay here. We look forward to your participation in all the further future editions of KLF. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words. And yes, I'm delighted to be here, especially that we are so close to the beach. But I do think we're all wearing the wrong kind of clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we should all be jumping into the water instead of uh, you know, doing a serious session on my book. But I'm very grateful for all of you for being here today. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, as I, I would like to invite your attention to the title of this book, which deals with uh, you know, one of Kishwar De um, Devika Rani's early appearances in Hindi cinema. And interestingly, the BBC has run a story today called The Longest Kiss and debated whether this really was The Longest Kiss. So it's wonderful that we're doing this session on the day that the BBC chose to have a discussion on the book. That is really interesting. Therefore, I think we'll begin on your journey from journalism to fiction writing. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, well, um, my journey, of course, is not as exciting as that of Devi Karani's, but I did start my work uh, as a journalist with the Indian Express in Chandigarh, which is a long way from here. And uh, then I moved into television, and I worked with all the big television channels, right from NDTV to TV Today, etc. I used to be an anchor. Uh, also a producer. Then uh, with ZTV, I became the vice president uh, of one of their channels. And then I realized that, uh, you know, television, your attention span is very limited. You cannot do very much beyond, uh, you know, capturing people's attention for more than one, one and a half minutes if you're doing a story. And that was for me very limiting because I wanted to go in depth into subjects that I was exposed to as a journalist every day. And so I decided to make the transition, which was very tough, into the world of writing. And suddenly, from being in a very buzzing office, surrounded by people all the time, which is what television is all about. I had a, about 100 people working for me, and I was like running here and there. I was suddenly in a very quiet room with only me and my computer and all the research around me. But that's how I started my journey into writing. And it has been a very, very fulfilling um, and exciting journey for me. And an equally rewarding one for your readers. Thank I can you. assure the readers, the audience here, that this is going to make a fascinating read for you. Well, um, even though you did make that move from journalism, one can find uh, the journalist you know, looming large in the pages of this book, in the method that you have adopted. There's a fascinating account of the life of Devika Rani, not from hearsay, not from rumors, you know, as a so uh, common when it, when it comes to the biographies of celebrities. But this is made based on authentic material, the letters of Devika Rani. And the way that the narrative fuses these letters in, it's almost like an epistolary novel at certain points, but some important um, chapters and episodes in Devika Rani's life have been uh, told to us through the letters that she wrote to her later husband, who about whom we will talk uh, very soon. Uh, yeah, so this pattern you know, of writing a novel in the form of letters, interspersing it, the narrative with letters, that's a very fascinating and a unique take. 
Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, as you very rightly said, I do not believe that I uh, could write a biography without it being absolutely as much as possible authentic. Because I know that a lot of film personalities have biographies written about them, which are mainly based on articles which have been written about them, or rumors, or speculation. Um, the first biography which I wrote uh, was actually on the life of Nargis and Sunil Dutt. That I had written in, um, I think, 2010, uh, 29, 2010, 2009. So it was, um, it was a time in my life that I realized that if one digs hard, you can actually find the information. For me, uh, I could get the information on Nargis and Sunil that because the children had a lot of diaries and letters of their parents. So I was able to get it from Namrita, Priya. We did extensive interviews with Sanjay Dath and the rest of the family. But uh, for Devika, she did not have any children. And nobody, because now we're talking about 100 years ago, because she was in... Uh, Bombay in 1927 when she met her first, uh, she, she was in London in 1927 when she met her first husband, Himanshu Rai, and they started talking about making cinema. So there is, there was nothing, nobody who knew her from that period who is still alive. So I as I was telling you, then I started on this very determined journey to find out something about her. Even the National Film Archives that I went to in Pune did not have anything on her apart from the films, which I found very fascinating. Beautiful films made by her husband, Himanshu Rai. I would urge all of you who haven't seen those early films made in the 1920s, silent cinema, excellent photography, excellent uh, cinematography, and even though it's silent cinema, you can just about follow the narrative so well. And these were actually everybody working on those films those days were uh, German technicians, British technicians. These were actually international films which were being made in the 1920s. So we get very excited today when a Natu Natu wins uh, uh, you know, the Golden Globe. But if you look at the kind of reviews that uh, Himanshu Rai's films were getting in the 1920s, you would be astonished that nobody I know of has got that kind of write-up those kind of um, you know wonderful cinematic reviews that he got. And similarly in Karma, where this uh, longest kiss comes from, because she, she and Himanshu, her husband, are acting in this film called Karma. And this was released in 1933. And everybody was raving about Devi Karani, not in India, but in London. And she was already getting offers from British uh, filmmakers, from Hollywood, etc. So these people had already set the trend of making international cinema in the 1920s. So when we get excited today, we must pay a homage to these, these uh, early filmmakers who were able to do it without social media, without much money, without the kind of backing that you see current filmmakers getting today. Absolutely. Uh, but even having said that, you know, the name of Himanshu Rai looms large, you know, when it comes to talking about Bombay Talkies, which gave us all those incredible movies. But going through the book, you realize that Himanshu Rai was not the most stable of persons and that he did run into rough weather quite a lot of times. And it was all the feisty lady that he, Devika Rani was who steadied the ship, to, so to say. And it's so different from the screen persona that we are familiar with. The demure, uh, Devika Very Rani. Delicate, yeah, yeah, delicate yeah. darling in those black and white movies looking so angelic and pretty. But here is a woman of steel who really took the company forward and whose decision on most matters actually made the difference. We would really like to know more about that side of Devika Rani. Sure. First, I just want to do a quick poll. How many of you have heard of Devika Rani or even seen any of her films? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So this is a big challenge because you, none of you have actually seen her. 
and uh, or seen her on screen. You probably don't know very much about her either. But what is interesting is that even people in the days when she was on the big screen knew very little about her because she was a very private person. One of the things that happened was that she uh, unfortunately was the victim of domestic abuse. Uh, her husband, Himanshu, who had this very glamorous persona as well, who gave a big break to a lot of the uh, heroes we see today or used to see a few decades ago, like Ashok Kumar, Dilip Kumar, etc. Uh, she actually gave a break to Dilip Kumar, but her husband gave a break to Ashok Kumar. Uh, but the thing is that he was not, as you said, he was pro probably on the verge of a nervous breakdown because of the pressures in those days of creating cinema. This is my understanding. I got all this information from the letters that she wrote to Svetoslav Rorik, which was her second husband. Now, have any of you heard of Svetoslav Rorik? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, so he was an amazing Russian artist. So Devika's life is pretty international. She starts her journey, her career in London. Then she goes to Germany to be trained in those days in German studios. This is before the first, uh, the Second World War. So it is in that in-between period between the two wars that she is there. The studio she works in um, give her lessons and she learns from Marlene Dietrich, which some of you may have heard of, of uh, makeup lessons and things like that. And then she returns to uh, Bombay and sets up this amazing studio called Bombay Talkies, which I hope some of you have heard of. Uh, because Bombay Talkies became a very, very popular studio, also because it was the only studio in those days which was listed on the stock market. And they used to earn a lot of money. But Himanshu's entire um, worry was how to make the films pay for themselves. So they used to make sometimes three films in a year. It was grueling work, very hard work. He had an international team working with him even there, some of whom were Germans. And so in the middle of all this, uh, you'll find the details in the book. Uh, Devika realizes it's getting too much for her, the domestic abuse, uh, the kind of uh, hard work she has to put in because She's extremely talented, which you will find if you see her films. She can sing beautifully herself. She doesn't need playback singers. That came later. She can sing. She can dance. She even designs the costumes. She does makeup. She does training. All of this, side by side, she's also the lead actress for many of the films which are coming out of Bombay Talkies. It is exhausting work. And in between, she meets this gorgeous, good-looking man called Najmul Hassan, who is her co-star. And I think she just gives up. I mean, she says, OK, he, they decide to run away. And in the middle of setting up this beautiful studio, getting everything on the road, she does this very public elopement with N Najmul Hassan and runs away to Calcutta. So I think this is amongst the many blows that Himanshu has to bear. But he chases after her and gets her back. However, she comes back on a high because now she knows the studio cannot run without her. So the balance shifts. All of that is in the book. The most um, important part comes when, uh, as, par as far as his nervous breakdown is concerned, is when in the Second World War, the Germans uh, in India who were there uh, are accused of being Nazis. Most of them were accused of being Nazis and then interned in camps. So all his technicians, his you know, the, that he's, he's to depend on. The British come in, because the British were still ruling India at that time. They come in and they lock up all these German technicians, as a result of which he is left bereft. So his wife has already betrayed him, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now this is the last blow. And so he has a very public nervous breakdown. So the Devika's life, what we see on screen and what was being reported there, 
uh, in, at that time, which I have uh, the press clippings, a lot of it is not even near what she was actually going through. And she was a pretty gutsy woman. She just decided she's not going to let circumstances uh, destroy her. She's going to be a survivor. And she's going to go out there and do what she wanted to do, which is have a career and have money. Because she realized that women have only true independence if they have money. Because without that, she would be dependent on some man. And that is what exploitation is all about. So she decides to head the studio. And how she, she does her machinations behind the scenes and comes to become the head of Bombay Talkies, outwitting many of the people, many of the men at that time, uh, including Sir uh, uh, you know, Atista Setalwad's uh, grandfather, who was at that time a very famous lawyer, Sir Setalwad. He was the chair of Bombay Talkies. So he's the guy who did the defense in, for, in favor of Indians during Jallianwala Bagh. So he was the person. So this book is full of that. You will find connections to so many well-known people that Bombay Talkies was connected to, including the founders of EPW, Economic and Political Weekly. I don't know if how many of you know about e EPW. You're too young, maybe, but it used to be a v pretty good magazine. So the guys who set up EPW, one of them was Devika's studio manager. He started his life there. So there is a lot of interconnection with Bombay society, with things which are happening. So this is not a woman working on her own in isolation. She is also the great grandniece of Rabindranath Tagore. So you cannot get uh, better than that. She's co well connected in that sense as well. So Devika's ra life, I found completely fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also like looking at Indian history through yeah. a different prism altogether. That's what this book offers you. you know, it's through the fil uh, f uh, world of films, you get to see what was happening in, 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 in India, time, yeah. unfolding in, in Indian time. history at that point of time. But um, having, coming back to Devika, you know, she was really a woman who scripted her own life. You know, she did not let play second fiddle to anyone else. But that is another important aspect of uh, this lady, which the book does mention. And even when you highlighted, you know, the other talents that we attribute to Devika, she was a dancer, a singer, a lead lady, um, the icon of glamour. But she was also a writer. In fact, she was one of the most important contributors to the script of the movie Karma, you know, where the longest kiss comes from. But surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, when the movie came out, the credits very um, naturally left her out, yeah. erased her name. You yeah, know, that yeah. speaks a lot for yeah. the erasure of women, yeah. you know, as no, writers uh, and as people behind the camera. It's only as act actors yeah. that we normally get to see them. But then the work that they do as part of the crew of the movie, it's, it's a history that often gets submerged. Yeah, absolutely. I was very fortunate that I found the original script for Karma, which is written in Devika's own handwriting. So this was something which is a true eye-opener for me. But then when I did my research, I realized that in the 1920s, 1930s, a lot of women were writing scripts at that time, but their husbands <laughs> took all the credit. So this is not unique. This was happening a lot, and other people were persuaded to do so. But you know, what is interesting uh, about her is that she took on the patriarchy. She took on the patriarchy and she said, well, if I assume she must have decided that she could lead her life on the same terms as men were leading it already. So if they could have affairs, if her husband could have affairs, why couldn't she? If he could earn money in a particular way, why couldn't she? Why couldn't she have uh, the stocks and shares in Bombay talkies? And she does that. That is how she becomes the head, the only woman in the 1940s to head a studio was Devika Rani, and she was well known. So people used to come and visit her, you know? So the Sarabhais, for example, I've got letters uh, from uh, Malika's uh, 
gra uh, grand aunt, Malika Sarabhai's grand aunt, and people like that, who are actually making an effort to go and see Devika because they go to the studio, which was in Malad, which at those days was on the, on the suburbs of Bombay, not where it is today. So they would make an effort to go and see her and meet her as a leading light, as a woman who was a career woman. Don't forget, this was India that was changing. This was just before independence. And there was still a, a, a great feeling within the Indians, we can do anything. And Gandhiji had broken the taboo of bringing women out of the household and going out there, uh, fighting alongside the men. So there was a lot of excitement and women like Devika were at the forefront. These are things which we have forgotten because she was a film actress, so we don't give her that much importance, but she was a very important influence yeah. on a lot of people. Really, and that's what shines through in this book. And I'm so glad you wrote this book, you know, because uh, we think of uh, Hazan Manto, Sadat Hazan Manto as a writer who has who lived during the time of Devika Rani and uh, Himan Shurai, a writer who comes across as a most sensitive writer and who's portrayed women in the most sensitive of lights. But it's really remarkably surprising to find the way in which Sadat Hazan Manto wrote about Devika Rani during the days that she headed Bombay Talkies. Yeah. He was very cruel about her. He writes a very uh, thinly disguised version of uh, Devika. And uh, I mean, he changes her name in the short story and so on. Uh, because I think, as I said, even though he was, an em he was an employee of Bombay Talkies, and Himanshu Rai was, at that time, a great great patron in cinema because almost everybody, all the big writers, all the big producers, um, you know, the, the whole Mukherjee clan that you have today, um, you know, uh, Tanuja's um, Kajol and all those people, they all came from the, their origins was because their fathers and grandfathers were working in Bombay Talkies. That was truly the space where it all began. So Himanshu was playing a very important r role, and Manto, like so many others who was working there as a scriptwriter, felt this is, you know, the Annadatta, the person who's taking everybody. And Devika, because she had this very conflicted a life which she was leading behind the scenes of being abused by her husband, of having to carry almost the burden, shoulder the burden of many of these films because she was the face of that, those films. If those films flopped, none of these people would have a job. So, you know, she felt that uh, very strongly and she kept on working. So she had no time to be close and have a drink with the boys and all that, which Himanshu could do. So. The, he became a great favorite uh, with everybody, including, as I mentioned, Hansa Vadkar, who was another, uh, you know, she's a very well-known Marathi actress. She was also there at that time. And she writes in her autobiography that when Himanshu enters the studio, the birds start chirping, the horses start neighing, the whatever, the elephants start dancing, and everything starts happening because he's such a great guy. But what he was, I only found out when I read uh, Devika's letters to Svetoslav, and you talk about her being a writer. These letters are amazing. Some of them go into 30 pages, 40 pages. And when he writes back, he's also writing the same. And they're writing to each other almost on a daily basis. So I'm thinking, when did they have the time to do anything else? You know, because, and most of these letters are written late at night after studio is over. And she had obviously no confidence, nobody to talk to. So except for this person who came into her life, uh, uh, first became her lover and then became her husband, as is very obvious in the letters that I found. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's a fascinating account. You know, the letters themselves make enough matter for a whole book, a very... And a movie, because it's now being made into a film. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so a big studio has bought the rights, and I think within six months, we should have the film going onto the floor. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the organizers here are glaring at me, and they want the audience to be invited in the discussion, so it's all yours if you have it. Yeah. I really thank both of you and the organizers for uh, organizing such a great event to know about uh, 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 Rony, Devika, uh, Rani. Devika Rani Rorich. I, I'm Gopal Krishna from Bangalore, from the land of... Yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah. you even know about now, them. Yeah, even now, even today, some 300 acres of uh, 
Tata Guni. Tata Guni is a gold mine. It's a yeah. uh, Tata Guni forest. Tata Guni, yeah. yes. It is in their name, still people are trying to grab. Oh. So that is very sad. I'm very happy to know about this. I have no questions, but I would like to have Please read the book. <laughs> yeah, definitely read and also see the movie, movie that is going to come up. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. So no questions. Devika Rani was in fact the first person, first, first woman to win the Dada Sahib Palki Award. Award yeah. Yes, she was given that and she also got the Padma Shri. Uh, she also got the Padma Shri along, um, I think then Nargis got it uh, after that. Yeah. But it was, um, it, it was quite remarkable that her achievements continued to be celebrated long after she became a recluse, just like this uh, gentleman has pointed out. Because with her husband, she went away and set up this estate in Tataguni, and uh, which unfortunately, since they didn't have any children, were, was later, you know, it exploited by the staff whom they had hired. Yeah. yeah. So I think we have to wind up the session. There we can. Just oh yes, there's one more, please. Oh. May, may I congratulate you oh. uh, on a very fascinating, I mean, what you put across, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Navin. Thank you. Uh, what you put across in 20 minutes is paints a very attractive picture of a very complex personality, bringing out the, those complexities. And um, uh, with, with the domestic abuse, being able to produce films, entering a man's world on a man's terms, perhaps a pioneer, the Gandhi kaleidoscope and background. Bollywood achievement, a member of society, and living life, not just on her own terms. So this is all that you have portrayed beautifully in 20 minutes. And I can't wait to rush. To read the book? Thank no, to, you. No, to buy the book first. <laughs> Everybody here should buy the book no, before <laughs> Thank we you. read it. Thank and you. secondly, if you just remain put, we'll all come to you for, our, for your signatures. And uh, madam, you uh, really brought out the best in Thank the speaker. You. Thank you. I was thinking that anchors very often take much more time than the speaker itself. But you were quite brilliant at bringing out the best. Of I'm humbled show. by that. Thank you very much. Thank well, you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so this Thank fascinating you, lady, Thank Devika Rani, who sizzled the black and white screen. But thanks to Kishwar Deshai, we now have the greys and all those fascinating areas in between the blacks and the whites. And we look forward to more splendid ones about her life as Devika Rani Rorik. Thank you very much.